In this video, I'm going to do a bunch of examples showing a use of the product rule. And so you actually already saw a bunch of examples of this um, on the, the sort of activity that you all did in class, those of you who were in class um, on Friday. Um, and uh, I'll talk about a couple of the examples we did there and also some other examples. Okay, so. The first example is actually one we did in class. Um, so if we have three kinds of cereal to choose and seven kinds of fruit, right, and we can choose one of each. I don't know if we did this example with exactly these numbers, but we did something like this. Um, if I get to choose one of each, right, then my choices are independent. Um, I can choose one of the three kinds of cereal, and then independently, I can choose one of the seven kinds of fruit. So the total number of you know, breakfast choices is three times seven, is 21. Right, again, because we could imagine drawing a little grid of uh, cereal choices, right? And the rows are kinds of cereal, and the columns are uh, fruits, right? And each cell in the grid is going to have, like, a particular kind of cereal with a particular kind of fruit on it. Um, and that is all the possibilities. So that's a product. Okay, uh, a non-example, right, is the same, but... You know, if you choose oatmeal, then you are limited to only three fruits. Right? I don't know, maybe the dining hall is very draconian, or maybe uh, you just have, you, you just think there are certain combinations of fruit on oatmeal that's disgusting, and so you'd only choose three things. I don't know. Um, but the point is, uh, of course, we could figure out how many combinations there are in this scenario, but we cannot directly use the product rule because these are no longer independent, right? My choice of uh, what type of cereal to have, um, if I choose oatmeal, then my choices for the fruits actually changes, right? So what I get to choose here depends on my other choice. And when the choices depend on each other like that, they're not independent. And so uh, we cannot directly use the product code. Okay. Um, here's another example. Uh, how many three letter strings are there using the letters A to Z? Uh, you know, for example, AAA is one, HDX, uh, you know, CAR, right? There's a bunch of these. How many are there? Um, well, uh, how does the product rule apply to this? If I think about choosing a three-letter string, right, I can actually think of, I get to choose each of these three letters, and, and they're all independent. Right, what letter I choose uh, for the first uh, spot doesn't affect what letters I, I still get to choose any of the 26 letters for the next spot and so on. Um, and I'm definitely just talking about strings, not words. Right, so I don't care if it's a valid English word or not, just any combination of three letters. Um, so these are independent. So first of all, We'll say, we'll notice that the number of two letter strings is going to be 26 times 26 um, because uh, the two choices of letters to use are independent. Okay, and then 
What about three letter strings? Uh, so choosing a three letter string is the same as first choosing a two letter string for the beginning. Then choosing uh, the third letter. Okay, and of course these are again independent, so the total number is, you know, so this was 26 times 26 for a two letter string times 26 for the last letter. Um, you know, which is, I don't know, what are, you can put it in your calculator if you want. Um, so why did I do it this way? Um, probably it's, you know, immediately obvious to many of you that the answer is going to be 26 times 26 times 26. Um, I did it out this carefully just to point out that the product rule, the way we stated it, uh, explicitly only talks about two things, uh, but we can extend it to more than two things by sort of doing the two, making two choices over and over. So. I first chose the first two letters, that was two things, and then I said, okay, that I'm gonna, is one choice, and then I'm going to make another choice of the last letter, and use the product rule again. Um, so this just shows that we can generalize, we can very easily generalize the product rule to talk about more than two things. If I've got, you know, n choices that are all independent, then I can just multiply the number of choices for all of them to get the overall number. Um, and you can easily prove that using, I mean, formally we would prove that using induction and iterate, like repeating the, the product rule of two things. Okay? Um, another example, one we've seen before, but I want to explicitly say how the product rule relates to it. So how many subsets are there uh, of an n element set. Okay, so this is really, we're talking about the power set. So what is the cardinality of the power set would be another way to ask this question. Um, and I think we've seen before uh, what the answer is, but let's think about how the product rule applies. Um, so if I want to choose a particular subset, um, how can I think of it breaking it down into independent choices? Well, basically every element of my set, of the original set, could be in the subset or not. So for each uh, of my n elements, I can look at it and say, hmm, do I want to cho choose this and have this go in my subset or do I want to leave it out? And then I can make the same choice for the next one and say, should this one go in or should it be out? And those are all independent because I can have any subset I want. So the fact that one element is in there uh, doesn't affect whether I can choose other elements to be in there or not. Okay, so this is really, uh, let's say, choosing a subset uh, consists of n independent choices should each element of the set know, in or out of the subset. Okay, so for each element, I've got two choices, right, in or out. And so by the product rule, the total number of choices is going to be, right, the product of all those. So hence, uh, number of subsets is going to be, right, two for the first element times two. All right, and multiply all those twos together, there's n of them, one for each element. So that's two to the n. Okay. So again, this is an example of you could memorize the formula that says the number of subsets is two to the n. Um, but it's much better to just understand how the product rule applies to it, and then you could figure it out um, from first principles. Okay. I think we have, I think I have one more example. Two more, actually.
Um, so I want to, again, talk about another thing that we did on the activity in class, um, which was like thinking about schedules for soup. So okay, so as a reminder, uh, did you have a bunch of kinds of soup? You got one of each, and you want it, you're going to eat one per day. And the question is just how many different schedules could you make of exactly which soups you eat on which day? Um, so if you have uh, five soups and five days, um, so you could say, well, I can choose for each day, I can choose which soup to eat. So that's five choices per day. I just multiply, you know, five times five times five. Um, but that's not correct, right? Because those choices would not be independent. Because once I've chosen, if I choose to eat tomato soup on the first day, um, I no longer get to choose tomato soup later. So that choice that I made on the first day actually affects what choices I have available on later days. Um, however, we can make them into independent choices by saying, well, once I've chosen one soup, that one's just not available, but now I get to choose any one of the remaining soups. And it doesn't really matter kind of which ones they are, I can just say, well, if I had a choice of five things on the first day, on the second day I can now independently choose among the four things that are left. Um, and so, so it's five independent choices of uh, what soup to eat among the soups that are left. Right, hence, I can choose, I get five choices on the first day, and then after that I get uh, four choices on the second day. You can even say, right, on the second to last day I have two choices, uh, which of the two remaining soups to eat. Um, and on the last day, uh, you could say on the last day I have one choice, uh, and so I get to choose which of the remaining one soups to eat, and of course there's only one way to do that, so um, get a one here, okay. So, and of course we write this as, this is five factorial, which in this case is 120, but. Um, or if I had, right, 10 soups and four days, right, it would be, I get 10 choices for the first day, and then I have nine choices, and then eight, and then seven, uh, which is gonna be something, again, use your calculator, I don't know. But again, um, there's probably formulas you could memorize here. You can memorize that, you know, the number of permutations of n things is n factorial, and, you know, if you take a permutation when you'd only want certain, you know, a certain number of them, uh, it's something related to factorials. But again, memorizing the formulas is not important. What's important is to understand how the product rule um, helped us to derive this. And I think many of you figured this out uh, during the activity. Okay, uh, one last example I want to do. Uh, how many functions are there? From a set A to a set B. Um, so, again, we can use the product rule. The question is, how does the product rule apply in this situation? Um, well, so for every element of A, I get to choose what element of B it's going to go to. If I think about choosing a function, right, um, how do I choose a function? Well, I basically have to say what it's going to do on every value of the domain. And those are all independent because a function can do whatever it wants. Uh, on each element of the domain. It doesn't have to be constrained by, you know, what it does on some elements doesn't have to be constrained by what it did on other elements. So uh, for each element of the domain, we can independently right, choose 
which element of the codomain A is sent to. That's right by the, using the product rule. My total number of choices is total number of choices is well. Uh, so for the first A, I have the cardinality of B choices. Right, that's all the choices I can make for which B to send that first A to. And then for the next valid, the next uh, element of A, I get another B choices. Right, I have B many choices for each element of the set A. So I multiply these a bunch of times. Right, and multiplying something a certain number of times, that's the same as that's what exponentiation means. So this is really the cardinality of B to the power of the cardinality of A. And as a final a challenge or something for you to think about, um, can you say how does this example relate to, this example actually relates to several other examples I did. So the one about uh, three letter strings definitely relates to that one. Um, also it relates to the, the example about counting the number of subsets. So see if you can uh, think about how to relate counting certain types of functions with uh, counting strings or counting subsets.